Hey, um, yeah, a little bit about me. I also have this podcast you might want to check out uh, where I talk, do a lot of interviews with a lot of people in strategy and other areas. Um, okay, so some of you might remember when you were back at Haas taking core strategy, we started off, at least my class did, with this case called cores, right? Sometimes I would do it during the orientation, right? And so in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go very, very back to the basics and then show how the stuff that you learn in a basic strategy class are relevant even today when we're talking about some of the most fundamental tech transformations that are impacting businesses. And so a lot of the themes are going to sound familiar. Maybe the way in which I reassemble the ingredients might seem a little novel. And part of the point of this exercise is to help you understand that the more things change, the more things stay the same. There's going to be elements of what you learn in business school that are going to be relevant to you 40, 50, 60 years later even though you have to engage in continuous learning to update on the new technologies and so forth. So let's just review this case. <laughs> Maybe I should cold call on some of my former <laughs> students and see if you remember, okay? But let's go way, way back to the 1970s or so where there were these two beer companies that were competing against each other, Coors and Anheuser-Busch, okay? And I have all the students go through the case, do the numbers, on the different companies, break down classic Harvard Business School style, break down the profitability, do kind of a unit analysis, unit cost analysis, relative cost analysis, unit economics on these different barrels of beer, and they come to the conclusion that Coors makes way more money than Anheuser-Busch on a per barrel basis. And then I ask them, well, why? Right, why? Okay, and of course there's a whole bunch of dead ends and false starts. But ultimately, we learn about this concept of the value chain, right? This is from McKinsey, it's, it's back from Michael Porter, you know, and every company has these different functions from procurement to you know, raw materials to assembly to marketing, R&D, you know, all and so forth and so on, okay? And so we dig deep into each of these and figure out like, what is it that's unique? What is it that's different about cores relative to the other beer companies, right? And so what we learn is that they have this massive right, manufacturing facility, this brewing facility, that achieves economies of scale. They also have high capacity utilization, right, because they only have a single product that is manufactured continuously. They also have a unique manufacturing process that involves no pasteurization whatsoever, okay? And then on the marketing side, they have a regional monopoly, and they ship this unpasteurized beer using refrigerated trucks to this region where they have no competitors on the shelf, okay? And so the whole point of this exercise, right, the whole point of this exercise is to show that there are these things called complementarities, okay? And this is probably one of the most important concepts you'll ever learn in business. Okay, you also learn it in other domains, right? So if you are, you know, into food, you know that certain Foods go with other foods. If you like wine, where's Pascal, right? If you like wine, you know that certain wines go with certain foods. And if, you know, if you're married, you know that certain people go with other people. <laughs> or not, or not, okay, right? So you know about this thing called complementarities. And so the point here is that the marketing fits with the manufacturing. The manufacturing fits with the labor practices. The labor practices fit with the procurement. In other words, there is an orchestration across all of the different divisions of the company, an orchestration across all of the different functional aspects of the company that allow it to hum, right? And this concept, we call it complementarity, right? Okay, so this is the idea. Now, you remember from basic micro, the whole idea of indifference curves, or do we skip over that? Maybe we did. Maybe you forgot it, right? But the idea of an indifference curve in the standard form that an economist will tell you about in microeconomics, says that you know, more is always better, okay? So if I'm gonna give you, right, more meat, it's like, woohoo, that's good. If I'm gonna give you more vegetables, woohoo, that's good. And so your utility curve, remember, is this upward sloping hill that's highest in the upper right and lowest in the lower left, okay? This should remind you, it should maybe traumatize you, I don't know, but this is something we typically learned. These contour maps of utility, 
right, are monotonic right, in all directions. Now, the concept of complementarity changes things a bit. Right? And so there's something called perfect complementarity, which has to do with things like right, left shoe and right shoe, or skis and bindings. Right? Maybe uh, iOS software and an Apple device. So it's such that if you have more of one without a corresponding increase in the other, it adds no value. Okay? In other words, if I give you a second left shoe without a corresponding right shoe, unless you only have one leg, this will not add any value. Okay, now if I take it to an extreme, we have this thing called extreme complementarity. And this says that even if I, if I increase one without increasing the other, I might actually decrease your utility. Right? So, for instance, the example I use has to do with rice and spice. So this contour map, this utility contour map, actually is like a ridge such that if I start off with a well-balanced bowl with some rice and some spice, and it's yummy and it's good, and then I add more spice without adding more rice, then my utility drops off. And I need to add more rice to compensate. I actually usually tell this story where I, the old dean, Rich Lyons, came over to my house for dinner, and I was cooking you know, for a big dinner party, and I was making this stew, and it had meat, and it had broth, and it had vegetables, and it was a little sour, so I decided to add some sugar. And so I grabbed the sugar bowl and, and tipped it into the stew. Bad move, especially after a couple glasses of wine, because the entire ball of sugar dropped into the stew. OK, I fell off this ridge into the valley. And I realized, crap, I need to add more meat. I need to add more vegetables. I need to add more stock. I need to add more you know, sour. I need to add more bitter. I need to add more everything to get back to that sweet spot. OK, so this is the idea of complementarity in a nutshell. OK, and it says that in order to determine the optimal amount in right, uh, variable x, I need to know how much variable y do I have. In other words, the answer is, you know it, it depends. And I think it was the class of 2020 that gave me a red button that every time I would hit it, it would say, it depends. And this came in super useful during the pandemic as a way of waking people up in the classroom. I could hit that button and get that sound. It depends, right? So it depends. So we need to know, if I'm like an Etch-a-Sketch, if I'm do I've got one dial on the X, one dial on the Y, if these things are left to independent decision makers, then I might wind up with a disaster. I might wind up with a Frankenstein company, a Frankenstein dish, right? a Frankenstein life. And so the whole point of strategy is that you need to kind of sit above those different decisions and, and orchestrate them in a synchronized way. That's what the conductor does in the, the orchestra, so to speak. Now, of course, the features we're talking about here within a company might be things like you know, operational flexibility and brand variety. So for instance, if I let the marketing decide how many different colors we're going to offer in cars, they're going to look at the customer. The customer's going to say, I want pink, I want green, I want red, I want purple. And they'll offer that in the catalog. Okay, but if I let the manufacturer decide what kind of factory to have, they're going to be like, yeah, we want long production runs. We want huge batch sizes. We want a factory that is incapable of switching. And if those two folks make their decision separately, we'll wind up with Frank and Company, right? So you have to orchestrate. You have to coordinate. You have to make sure that these things fit. Okay, they have to fit. And indeed, you're not going to have a ridge. You're probably going to have something closer. This is the wackiest uh, clicker here. We're going to wind up with something like a hill. Okay, and we're going to have to see what we can do to make sure we get to the top of that, that hill. So the point of that whole lesson, the entire first class, right, of I'm whipping through the entire semester. You're wondering, wait, why did I spend a whole semester on this when I could have done it an hour at the alumni event, right? Because <laughs> we've got to make sure you get your you know, $150,000 worth, right? Okay, so you know, this comes in, this is the freebie, right? This is the freebie. Okay, so the whole point, and to, this is, back in the day before people were more culturally sensitive, they used to talk about the Chinese menu approach to things. Okay, what was this about? If you went to a Chinese restaurant in the 1970s in a suburban America, you know, like where I lived, 
um, the, the people weren't very educated about Chinese food. So in order to educate them, the, the, the owners of the restaurants would make it super simple. And they'd say like, listen, just pick your meat, pick your vegetable, pick your sauce, pick your starch, okay? And that, then you've assembled your own dish, okay? And so you would isolate each decision and think, well, I love, you know, I love rice, uh, I love garlic, I love chocolate, you know, let's put it all together, right? <laughs> okay? And so the point here is that you can't take a Chinese menu approach, what is wrong with this, this clicker? You can't take a Chinese menu approach to strategy. Things have to fit. There has to be this idea of fit. Now, Alfred Chandler, who is sort of the leading thinker in the 20th century of management, professor at Harvard, right, he came up with this idea that your structure, your organizational structure, has to fit with your strategy, just like all of the different parts of the company have to fit with the other parts of the company, and the corporate strategy has to fit with the environment. There's internal fit and external fit. But the point here is that the capital Right? The human capital, the organizational structure, the organizational architecture, the tech, and the strategy all have to fit together. And he wrote a whole bunch of stuff about this. Okay, I don't, I don't know what's going on with this clicker here. Um, sorry about that. He, he wrote all about, uh, yeah, maybe give me that clicker instead. Um, so he wrote all about this in a couple different books, right, which were super, super influential. And he described how performance comes from good fit, and mismatches lead to subpar performance. And so he described the M form. M form organization was the dominant form in the late 19th, early 20th century. You think about things like DuPont, think about Ford, right? Think about the big oil companies, the railroads, and so forth, right? They were organized in this way to take advantage of the first industrial and second industrial revolution. Okay, now let's fast forward to our friends over at Coors, okay? And usually what I'll do is I'll ask the students after the first part, you know, which company would you invest in based on the numbers? And they'll say, well, I mean, Coors is making twice as much money per barrel as Anheuser-Busch. Let's go buy some Coors stock. And of course what happens is Coors stock was completely flat for the next eight years. Anheuser-Busch stock took off. So what happened? Well, if we go back and look at the numbers, we see that things completely flipped. Now Anheuser-Busch is making more per barrel and Coors is making less per barrel. Hold on a second, we just got through describing how perfect their business model was. So why are they doing poorly now? Well, what happened was the environment changed. The environment changed, okay? And what happened was Anheuser-Busch decided to open, right, this whole national uh, set of, they opened up in the West, so Coors no longer had a, a monopoly in the West, okay? And this basically led to the demise of, of Coors. So, so why couldn't Coors just simply respond to this change in the environment, right? Why couldn't they just say, okay, world's different, we need to be different. World's changed, we need to change. The problem is the thing that made them so good is the thing that holds them back, right? The reason why they were so good is because every single part of the company fit with every other part of the company, which means that you can't change one part of the company without changing everything, right? You know, it's like a football team. You change the quarterback, you probably have to change now the offensive line. Now you have to change like every aspect of the company, right? So the fact that everything fits so well meant that if you pull one sort of strand of that sweater, the whole sweater falls apart. If I decide I'm going to go national, okay, now I need, uh, you know, pasteurized beer, and I, now I need to, you know, license the, the distribution. Now I need, like, everything is going gonna, is gonna to change, and that's why we talk about, right, companies as aircraft carriers, and it's really difficult to turn the aircraft carrier on a dime. Okay, and if we follow forward, it just gets worse and worse for Coors. So this model of the company that Coors kind of exemplified is, is this model that so many companies exemplified in the United States in the 20th century. You know, large-scale production, right? This is Henry Ford's River Rouge plant, right? Massive, the most efficient manufacturer of cars in the world at, in its day. Of course, if you wanted to buy a Model T, you could have it in any color you wanted so long 
as it was black, right? And of course, this meant it was very, very difficult for them to change when consumer preferences changed, okay? So what makes you good is also what holds you back. Now, there's another amazing theorist of the 20th century after Alfred Chandler, this guy named Ronald Coase. And Ronald Coase, he talked about, right, why it is that we have firms in the first place. Right, if the markets work so well, if, we, right, if you know, Adam Smith is right and the price mechanism is so well functioning, why do we even need companies? Because companies are these domains where the price system and the supply and demand and the market system is basically shut off. Right? Within a firm, it's command and control. It's administrative hierarchies. Right? It's like the Soviet Union, but in sort of smaller scale. Right? Why would we ever do this? Okay, and he came up with this framework that said, right, transacting on the market can be expensive, right? Transacting on the market can be expensive. We have these things called transaction costs. And when the transaction costs are high, right, which is coordinating across firm boundaries, right, you know, you've got your company, I've got my company, and we've got to somehow, like, come to some agreement on how we're going to get things done, okay, that's expensive. We bring it in-house because Henry Ford can be like, all right, do this, do that, do this, you know? That coordination that we were talking about, the orchestration of marketing, right, if marketing had to transact with manufacturing uh, through some market interface, right, it would be very difficult to coordinate and you'd probably get some mismatches. So that's why we have this boss. That's why we have the strategist. That's why we have the C-suite, right? Okay, now let's go back to these cars. So did Henry Ford make everything? Well, he tried, and initially he thought that was the best way to go. Henry Ford made his own brakes, he made his own tires, he made his own dashboards, he made everything himself. He even went and acquired a plantation in Brazil the size of Rhode Island to grow his own rubber. He bought stands of forests in Minnesota, right, to grow his own trees for the wood panels on the side of the cars. Right, so one of the things that you see in early American industrialization is this highly vertically integrated system. But over time, they realized, hey, we can't do everything. We need to outsource, right? We need to buy things. And so there evolved a whole system of suppliers, an ecosystem of suppliers, tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers, right? And the only way, of course, that you can make this work in an efficient way is, as we'll see, to develop standardized interfaces. So a standardized interface is where you say, OK, here are the specs that I need for breaks, and I need a bunch of companies to compete to see which one can provide me with those breaks at the lowest cost. Right? So standardized interfaces are what allowed for the emergence of a deep and rich and liquid market for components. Right? So for instance, with your car, right? when your tires get bald, what do you do? Right? You go and buy new tires, and you have a choice. You could buy Michelin. You could buy you know, Bridgestone. You could buy Goodyear. Right? And they're all going to conform to the same specs as long as you know right, what the dimensions are for your, your tires. Okay? And so what emerges is this ecosystem. Right? And this ecosystem is what we call sometimes a modular system. So this is another one of my favorite examples that I talk about in my strategy class. What is a modular system? Okay, so I always use this as my example. When I was a kid, right, I went out and bought this stereo with my, uh, my money I've earned, you know, working uh, probably illegally in all sorts of jobs. Okay, I bought this stereo, and I remember my father came in and said, hey, this sounds great. I would love to get myself one of these stereos. So he bought one of these. OK, this is something that we call an appliance. OK, there's a whole literature on appliance versus modular systems. Now, which one's better? Oh, who said it depends? <laughs> so now we know who actually completed the MBA. <laughs> and who dropped out and decided just to come back and crash, right? Because if you say it depends, then that means you have learned something <laughs> in your business school education. $150,000 per insight, OK? All right, yes. It depends. Now, look, when you ask an amateur, an amateur who hasn't had the background of a Haas MBA, they're going to say, oh, man, that system on the right is so much better, you know? Like, oh, audio quality, everything else. 
Okay, and when, when you ask them to dig deeper, you say, why? And so what they'll say is, typical answer, well, what's great about the thing on the right is if one component breaks, right, you can replace that component without replacing the whole thing. Similarly, like with your car, if you get a flat tire, you don't have to buy a new car, right? So in other words, it's more fault tolerant than the thing on, on the left. And so what this means is that when you have asynchronous replacement cycles, you want the thing on the right. Now, in today's world, why do you replace things? You don't replace them because they break. You replace them because they're outmoded or they're obsolete. So when you have asynchronous innovation cycles, you want to have a modular system. Right? So if your hardware lasts longer than your software, you want to have a modular system. You with me? Now, the other advantage of the modular system is that you can do like best of breed. So think about if you have four manufacturers, all of whom are making this thing on the left. What's your choice set as a consumer? You have four choices. But if you have four manufacturers, each of whom are making the four systems on the right, what's your choice set? Not 16, come on. I know you don't learn a lot of math in the MBA, but come on. 256, four to the fourth. So a simple linear increase in modularity creates a geometric increase in your choice set, okay? So this is something called networks effect, network effects. I could use Metcalfe's law if you want to cite another you know, uh, management scholar or you know, network scholar, okay? And of course, this concept is something that you see in other domains, right? So if you go to Chipotle, how many different kinds of burritos can you get at Chipotle? 1,000? 10,000? 100,000? I haven't done the math, but I'm guessing you could get millions, right? Because you can choose your meat, you can choose your vegetable, choose your starch, whatever, and that's going to give you this massive, right, almost infinite number of, of possibilities. Okay, so modularity is a concept that we see everywhere. Okay, we see it on our phone. There are no two individuals here that have an identical phone because the phone is simply the collection of apps that you have on the phone. Okay, so look, we've, you know, I mean, I'm almost like a PR guy for this thing on the right. So somebody wanna stick up for the thing on the left, right, there's gotta be some cost or drawback or obstacle to adopting this system on the right. And it's mainly, the main obstacle is this. In order for it to work, you have to have these standardized interfaces. Okay, and standardized interfaces don't grow on trees. Okay, they don't emerge spontaneously all the time. They have to actually be created either through centralized fiat or through some organic process. So for instance, right, if we go back to the days of the railroad here in the US, I'm, I'm using all these historical examples, I apologize, but that's how I was trained. I was an historian back in the day. So if you go back and look at these railroads in the 19th century, there were railroads that originated on the East Coast and one in the South and one on the West Coast, and well, not West Coast, but you know, North Coast. And everything was fine until they met in the middle. And what they discover? That the gauges didn't line up. And so you had to lift the train off one set of wheels onto another set of wheels. Now look, how are you gonna set up a national system of commerce if you're gonna be lifting trains all the time in the middle of Indiana? It's not gonna work. And we have the same problem in Europe. You can't go from Russia to Lisbon, right, on a train. You gotta get off the train twice, okay? Now, sometimes when I ask, is this a good thing or a bad thing, it's like, well, you know, what's the answer? <laughs> it depends, right? You know, maybe we don't want the Russians, you know, coming our way, you know? Maybe having a little speed bump is a good thing, right? I don't know. Maybe if the Ukraine had a different gauge, you know, we'd be having a different story right now. I don't know. Okay, all right, but the point here is that, you know, standardized interfaces don't emerge spontaneously. And so this is the worldwide distribution of railroad gauges, okay? And this is the worldwide distribution of electrical sockets. So if some of you are coming here from abroad, you had to bring some kind of adapter to make it work, okay? And so if we get back to this system that dominated in the United States for most of the 20th century, right, with the emergence of these large-scale industrial firms, Right, what, what made this possible, what made this kind of outsourcing possible was what I call arm's length relationships, arm's length contracting, right, where 
a company like Ford, like General Motors, would essentially publish something like an RFP and say, here's what we need, and there'd be a universe of competitors who would try to satisfy right, those requirements. Okay? And remember, those suppliers could switch very easily. If I'm a brake manufacturer, I can supply GM, and then I can supply Ford, and I can support, supply Chrysler, and if I lose this contract, I get this contract, right? And as a Ford, I can switch from Bosch to, you know, Another supplier kind of just at a moment's notice. It's just about click, clicking more or less, right? Not a huge adjustment or transaction, trans, trans, uh, trans cost. And the same thing is true in the labor markets, right? Labor is somewhat standardized in America. You know, if somebody leaves Ford and stops working at the assembly plant at Ford, they can start working at the GM assembly plant. You know, if you stop working at Facebook, you can start working at Google. No big deal. I'm sure you, all of you guys have had like 10 different jobs in the last 10 years, right? You probably had 10 different jobs in the last month for all I know, okay? If you're an Uber driver, you have, right? Okay, so look, the point here is that our labor markets are, are modular. And what about our management markets? In America, you could be the CEO of a, a rubber company and then become the CEO of a retailer, and then switch and become the CEO of, of, a, uh, of a tech firm, right? You could be selling Pepsi one day and selling laptops the next day, right? And that's because of our general purpose, modular education, right, the MBA, right? It's also because we have standardized accounting rules. So, you know, you can go in as an analyst, you can analyze one company and then analyze another company, right? Wall Street allows capital to flow from one company to the next. Right? We have these standardized interfaces that you can read the financial statements of one company, read the financial statements of another company, and kind of compare them back and forth. Okay? And then, of course, bankruptcy allows for money to leave companies as easily as it can go into companies. And then what about ideas? We have these highly liquid, right, arm's length contractual mechanisms that allow you to license intellectual property. Okay? So we have markets, fully functioning markets that have generalized rules that allow for switching to be relatively cheap across suppliers of your IP, suppliers of your labor, suppliers of your capital, and suppliers of your components. Now, that worked okay until the 90s when all of a sudden I was in business school. And anybody here in business school in the 90s? Wow, you guys look pretty good for someone who was in business school in the 90s. I want to know what your fountain of youth is because I was there in the 90s, and look at me, okay? <laughs> But when we were in school in the early 90s, right, it was like, oh my God, Japan is going to crush us. They're killing us. You know, Toyota, they're going to put us all out of business and so forth because they had different practices, right? They had different practices. We know about Kanban and Kaizen, right, the Toyota method. Now, what was different about the, the Japanese system is they actually, right, did not rely either on vertical integration or on these arm's length contracts. Instead, they relied on something we call relational contracts. So the Koretsus, these were sort of, you know, you'd have captive suppliers, right? So Toyota had a suite of captive suppliers. Those captive suppliers, you know, often, you know, did not work for Nissan or did not work for Honda, okay? It was almost like they were part of Toyota but kind of not part of Toyota. There would be these rotating kind of management that would switch from you know, one company to their supplier company, right? And so it was not arm's length. Similarly, labor markets were not arm's length. They weren't liquid. If you went to work for one of these companies, you went to work for life, okay? And how did you become good at your job? Did you spend your time learning about finance and management and other kinds of general application skills? No, you learned about who do I need to talk to in the organization to get stuff done. Now look, this is a matter of, I'm exaggerating here, but the idea is that you would invest in firm-specific human capital and not general human capital, which made switching from one employer to the next very, very difficult. Same thing with finance. These companies relied on banks for their finance, not on equity markets. And the banks would basically be long-term suppliers of capital over long periods of time. It was relational. The folks at the bank would get to know the company very well. The folks at the company would get to know the bank very well. 
If you're a banker in the US, you're like, if it's Tuesday, I guess I'm buying, you know, I'm working with this company. If it's Wednesday, I'm working with this company. Here, if you're Mitsubishi Bank, you're working with Mitsubishi Motors, and you're working with Mitsubishi you know, uh, Shipping, and Mitsubishi Tuna, and everybody else, okay? And so very, very different sort of systems. And so the way I think about it is that in the US, we worked on developing these standardized interfaces in labor markets, capital markets, and supplier markets, whereas in Japan, you had these highly idiosyncratic and interfaces between all the different elements that went into the production of, of a good. So what, what drove this, right? Is it because there's complementarities here? If I use a particular type of labor, does that mean I need to use a particular type of supplier? I think there's a lot of literature that says yes. But behind it all, I think you could say, is the legal system, right? And so if you look at the number of lawyers in the US, number of lawyers in Japan, it's a huge difference, okay? So our legal system in the US enables sort of, you know, one-click purchasing from all these different suppliers of inputs, okay? And so look, what was the benefit of the American system and what was the, which is better, the American system or the Japanese system? Depends. It depends, <laughs> yes, right? So look, America was really good at, so what was good about Japan was Japan was really good at innovating across these interfaces, right? So if I'm a car manufacturer and you're a brake manufacturer and we want to kind of rethink how these parts fit together, we can kind of get together and talk about it. If I'm a worker and I'm in one part of the production assembly line and you're a worker in another part of the production line and we want to figure out a way to make it work better, we kind of get together and we talk about it, right? So. Innovation in the US was really, you can think of it as happening kind of within these boundaries, whereas you know, in Japan it was really across these boundaries. And so we have these two different kind of systems, right? And Japan was better at innovating in certain ways, and the US was better at innovating in other ways. And right around this time in the 90s, people started wondering, like, can we have our cake and eat it too? Right? Can we have our cake and eat it too? So in economics, we talk about trade-offs along the frontier, and then we talk about moving the frontier. And so around the same time, there were folks at Stanford and at Berkeley who were asking these questions. Right? How can we kind of have the best of both worlds? Okay, how can we push this frontier out and take advantage of both? And I think the solution here had to do with the development of new, new technologies new technologies that enabled us to exploit both kinds of innovation. So I take us to one of our other cases that you did, we did in strategy. For those of you who remember and aren't traumatized, you might remember we talked about Walmart. What made Walmart so successful? What made Walmart so successful? They were successful because they embraced IT very early on. They invested a huge amount in IT. Now, what was the benefit of this IT, this infrastructure, using point of sale data capture and so forth? Well, the typical story that you hear is all about how they were able to take this data that they captured at the point of sale and push it back to the warehousing, push it back to the procurement and so forth, right, through these internal Right, high quality data systems. Very, very important. Again, that's consistent with the story of the American firm, right? Within firm boundaries, you have these fantastic communication channels, right? But what makes it more interesting is that they also developed a system for communicating across firm boundaries as effectively as within firm boundaries. In other words, this data about sales didn't simply end at the warehouse or at the procurement division, but it passed on to the CPG companies. It passed on to Procter & Gamble, it passed on to Unilever, it passed on to Coke and Pepsi, okay? And the technology that they used was this thing called EDI, okay? So this is an early form of firm-to-firm -firm communication, early form of companies talking to companies through IT, okay? And of course now, right, EDI is being supplanted both, you know, physically and kind of conceptually with this new technology called APIs, okay? And so what are APIs? APIs effectively allow 
for the development of standardized interfaces across companies, even if you're starting off with something that might not look standard. Okay? And so what we've been able to do through the emergence, and I'll dig into this new technology, right, which is, I think, at the heart of digital transformation, is that we've been able to dramatically reduce all sorts of costs across the board. So I'll just give you an example, a metaphor, for how this is working. Think about international transportation of goods. What has caused this dramatic reduction, which is close to a 90% reduction uh, in kind of uh, moving freight from China to the US, from Europe to the US, from China to Europe? What is responsible for this? Yes. The container. Now, the container is not a digital technology, but what makes the container so valuable is that it is a standard. Okay, it's a standard, it's an agreed upon standard. And without this agreed upon standard, what did you have? You had these interfaces which were non-standard. You had massive amounts of labor involved in you know, moving goods from ships to trucks, trucks to planes and so forth, right? These people called stevedores, okay? And then with the emergence of the container, this is what made this possible. Right? This is what made this possible. Without this standardized interface, this container, which again, typical container did not contain anything digital, right? but it allowed for the emergence of all this digital infrastructure because now we have something that is a standard. Okay? And so APIs, again, if I hate to sound like a broken record because I gave a talk on this a couple years back, Right, but APIs are the connective tissue and the glue of the modern economy. Right? Ten years ago, I would talk to CEOs that couldn't spell API. <laughs> but now, if your CEO doesn't know what an API is, you need to either get a new CEO or a new job. Okay? So when, next time you see a CEO in the elevator, pull, him, pull, pull her aside, pull him aside and say, hey, what's our API strategy? And they're like, what? Okay, go, okay, where's my LinkedIn? Because I got to get the heck out of here. <laughs> People don't know what they're doing. Okay? Okay, so other standards, well, we'll talk about, we can't talk about that, but look, what's the idea behind API? Now, this is an example that I actually developed with this, this just this uh, set of slides with one of your other fellow alums who's not here today, right? Uh, to understand how APIs work, just imagine every single time you open up your phone and you go to a place like Kayak, right? You get a ticket to go somewhere, go to London. What happens on the back end is you see all this communication between Kayak and all of these airline companies. Now, for those of you who remember travel agents, I'm looking at you folks over here from the 90s, <laughs> right, where you'd go in and have like faxes and phone calls and stuff, okay, and then you had the terminals, right, the Apollo terminal, Sabre terminal, and so forth. Okay, that's all been replaced by APIs. So while this little thing is spinning, what you have is this communication, and then boom, you get a result. So what just happened here on the back end? Right? You know, United might have code that's written in one language, and the GDS has codes written in another language, and Kayak might be written in a third language. How do they talk to each other? APIs. APIs are the digital glue that make the modern economy possible. Okay, you have computers talking to computers, right? Software talking to software, okay? Now, let's dig a little deeper because when you go to the United app, right, what do you see? You see all these little buttons. All these little buttons correspond to some specific functionality within United's code base, right? If you wanna book a seat, you got, they gotta know what your status is, right? If you, they wanna give you miles, they need to know what flight you were on. Right? If, if they're going to price you, they need to know all sorts of stuff about you know, inventory availability and so forth. So all of these different functionalities, how do they communicate with each other? APIs. Right? So not only do we have companies talking to companies, but we have divisions of companies talking to other divisions of companies. We have functionalities within the company talking to other functionalities with the company. And all of it is done through APIs. Now here's where it gets even more interesting. Okay? And you've maybe heard this example before. What happens if United wants to provide limousine service to the airport? Do they have to go and build out a limousine service? Do they have to sit down with the lawyers and enter into some contract with a supplier of limousine services? No. 
All they have to do is put the Uber app inside the United app. They just drag and drop the Uber app functionality into the United app functionality, okay? Because Uber has already done this, okay? And now our United computers talk to our Uber computers. Now, when you get into the Uber, you see a map, and there's an old slide. Did Uber have to build out a map of the world before they could get into business? No, right? Because Google already did it. So you got a Google map in the Uber app, okay? And then, of course, when you make the payment, what happens? Right, you've got Braintree, or you've got Agin, or you've got Stripe, or somebody else that's already built out payment functionality. And so you just drag and drop that into the Uber app as well. So what do we have here? We have all these companies talking to all these companies, right? And they're all doing it with the push of a button with some drag and drop, okay? And so every company now is a chimera, okay? Have you heard, you know what a chimera is? So I was, I was reading about, the, there's this horrible story about this, this woman who had her, was gonna have her kids taken away from her because uh, her, um, her genes did not match her kids' genes. Okay, and then they dug a little deeper and they discovered that she had two sets of genes because she'd swallowed a twin sister in, in the womb, you know, and, and uh, you know, that's what we call a chimera. A chimera is basically when you have two different kind of DNAs in your body, or if you're like an animal that has like the head of a lion and the head of a, you know, I don't know what the hell that is, some kind of <laughs> aardvark, I don't know. Okay, but anyway, that's what a chimera is. Every company now is a chimera because the code is essentially it's a drag and drop, cut and paste assemblage of code from all sorts of other places, some of which is open source, some of which is proprietary, whatever. And there's all sorts of you know, click license agreements and so forth. Okay, and so you know, SDKs are another big part of that, which we won't get into. So the point here is that these large scale companies that we kind of take for granted, like the Wells Fargo's of the world that have all these different functionalities, kind of like the old school Ford model, Ultimately, we have these pure play companies, these fintech startups that are trying to provide just a single service. And when you think about, oh my gosh, I don't want to deal with 500 different like pure play services. Well, first of all, you can assemble them together using APIs, reconstruct right, your appliance as a modular system. Or companies like Wells Fargo can use these things on the back end without you even knowing about them. Or the fintechs could be using Wells Fargo on the back end without you even knowing about them. Because you have infinite flexibility. It is like the Chipotle menu, right? All the different variety you can put together for services. Now what this means, of course, is that you, 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 and you, can all start billion dollar unicorns in your spare time. Well, maybe not, maybe not spare time. You might have to devote a little more time to it. But you can do it in your bedroom. You can do it in your basement because you don't need to have your own IT infrastructure. That's why God invented AWS, right? You don't need your own real estate because we got, you know, WeWork. Well, that's not exactly uh, an API, <laughs> but you get it, okay? We got all these different, you want, you want a CFO? We got CFO as a service. You want customer service? We got customer service as a service. You want inventory management? We got that as a service. You want payroll? We got that as a service. You want compliance? You got that as a service, right? And it's all just about like finding the right API and drag and drop it into right, your, your code. That's it. This is what is making our economy so dynamic right now in spite of the decline in the NASDAQ, which is just a blip. Okay, don't worry about it. Okay? Now the company that I think does this the best, which I have been following since inception, right? I've been a big fan of Amazon since day one, okay? Although they'll tell you it's still day one there, okay? And what they do is they've organized the entire company around APIs, like everything. Everything they do is built around APIs, okay? Now, you might be thinking, oh, well, you know, I run a restaurant, can I do this? Well, yeah, you can actually. Or I run a university, can I do this? Yeah, you can actually, okay? It's tough, but you can do it. So what they've done is they've basically created every process is broken down into its constituent bits, and each of those bits communicates with the other bits through APIs. So the normal orchestration that we think about taking place at the strategic level where you have sort of you know, command and control right, within the firm is actually disbanded. You have something that's much more right, like market interfaces between the different parts of the firm. Okay? And so this is what's made it possible for Amazon to, to morph and change and evolve so quickly. Not like cores, right? 
they don't get stuck. The world changes, they change. And they do it very, very quickly. Okay, so for instance, you know, fulfillment by Amazon. How did this emerge? And how did this grow so quickly? Well, it's because it was just a matter of exposing an API, more or less, right? And then understanding that you can take this entire sequence of events and you can say, okay, we're gonna stop making this, start buying this. We're gonna stop buying this, start making this. And then we'll leave options open so we can flip on and off depending on circumstances. Right, so what they do is they build their company out of, you know, you can think of it as Lego bricks. This metaphor now is something I think we all have heard, hopefully you've heard about it. But the whole point of the Lego brick metaphor is, is real. And it's not just about tech, of course, it's about processes. Right? It's about processes and it's about people. And so a typical company, and again, I'm using software as a metaphor for processes, but a typical company was uh, kind of created like cores where every single element was so integral to every other element that you could not go in and pluck out right, one element. Maybe I should be using Jenga here, right? Because you, know, you pull out one element, the whole thing collapses. But here, this is how Amazon thinks about corporate organization and corporate functionality, where you make and you buy, okay, and then you can switch from making and buying depending on the circumstances. And instead of buying from one, you can buy from another. Okay, you can replace the blue with another yellow or you can replace the blue with a red. Okay, it's highly, highly modular. So this type of Lego bricks, the kind that I used as a kid, maybe you folks from the 90s might remember these Lego bricks. These are not the kind of Lego bricks that our kids ask for, right? They want these Lego bricks. Now what's the problem with these Lego bricks? Yeah, they're good for one thing and one thing only. And then when your kid gets bored, you gotta go buy some more Lego bricks. So this is great for the Lego company, but it's not so great for the parents, okay? So we don't want these Lego bricks. We want these Lego bricks. So this whole idea of API, right, it's not simply about external APIs like Google Maps. It's all about the internal APIs about how companies are organized internally. And this is what Jeff Bezos said in 2003. 2003, what were you doing in 2003? Okay, you weren't doing this. He said, all teams will expose their data. Teams must communicate through interfaces, nothing else. Think about how teams in your company communicate. An interface without exception must be externalizable at the flip of a switch, meaning that we don't know who our customers are. Maybe our customers are the people down the hall, maybe the customers are down the country, maybe down on the other continent, right? And we need to be able to flip them on and off at will. And so you've heard about two pizza teams, right? You take everything, every process, and you make it as granular as possible. This is giving rise to something called the composable enterprise. So think about this idea of externalizability. Right, the one-click button, okay? If you wanna put a one-click button on your website, you can do it. In fact, oftentimes, I will be walking down the street, you know, walking to Haas from home, I'll get an email from some charity, you know, like Médecins Sans Frontières, they'll be like, hey, you know, we got all these people dying, give us 100 bucks. I'm like, yeah, I'll give you 100 bucks. So I click on it, and it's like, fill out your address and stuff, and a credit card. I'm like, you know, I care about them, but I, I, you know, I, I can't do it right now, okay? And then I forget. You go to another one, okay, like, I don't know, a Syrian uh, relief fund, and, and they got a one-click button. They get 100 bucks. That's the difference between 100 bucks and not 100 bucks. They use the Amazon one-click button. Now, if you want to use the Amazon one-click button, what do you have to do? Do you have to, like, you know, sit down and negotiate for, like, six months to figure out how you're going to use this? No. You just drag and drop it, bingo, done, no big deal and you're getting the exact same functionality that Amazon has on their own website, right? Okay, or if you think about Amazon cloud business, the only reason why the Amazon cloud business exists as a business is because Amazon was able to take the services that they were providing internally and just make them available to external purchasers through the flip of a switch, okay? So another famous theorist here, which I have to mention, is this guy named Conway. He came up with this thing called Conway's Law. Conway's Law says organizations which design systems 
are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of their organization. If you understand how different parts of the organization communicate with each other, then you'll know how that company is going to interact with the external world. You know how those products are going to be designed, how they're going to be serviced, and what they're going to look like. Okay. In other words, if I know, the way I say this, if I know your API strategy, I know your strategy. That's it. That is your strategy, how you are organized to communicate internally and externally. If I know the communication, if I know how teams communicate with teams, if I know how individuals communicate with individuals, if I know how divisions communicate with divisions, if I know how you communicate with your suppliers and your customers, I know your entire strategy, okay? Architecture, think back to Chandler. Organization fits with strategy, okay? So there's lots of evidence on this, lots of evidence on how companies are working to redesign their internal structure, starting with IT, okay, around things called service-oriented architecture. You've heard this lingo, right? You've heard of DevOps, right? You've heard of you know, uh, cloud, of course, right? You've heard of all this, this new lingo, and it's really all about ripping out the nervous system of your organization and replacing it with a new type of nervous system. And if you do this right, you go from linear innovation to exponential innovation, okay? So I'll just give you an example. California DMV, how many times do you think the California DMV has uh, done a software deployment in the last year? <laughs> right, okay. The Social Security Division of the US government, how often do you think they do a software deployment? By the way, anybody here know COBOL? All right, there you go. You got a job in the Social Security Department of the US government, there you go, all right. So. You know, it wasn't that long ago that you could work at a large American company and you would have a new software deployment every six months, maybe? Every nine months. How often does your company do a software deployment? Hope it's not every six months. Once a day? Maybe? Once an hour? Okay. Here's a slide from 2015, just to show you how far ahead of the pack Amazon was in 2015, right? 23,000 software deployments a day. A day. Look at Twitter, three a week. Okay. This is 2015. Which stock are you going to buy, right? We're always looking for leading indicators. All right? Now, of course, this is 2015. What is it today? Actually, I don't know what it is today. I know what it is like two years ago when I put this slide together. 600,000 a day. 600,000 software deployments a day. Okay, now we're not talking about doubling or tripling or quadrupling the agility and the speed with which these companies are operating. We're talking about exponential, right, increases in the speed with which you change. So what this means is that circumstances change, the world changes, can you change? Are you architected to change? Are you built to change? Okay, so we all know about Tesla, of course, one of my favorite examples. If you're Mercedes-Benz, if you're Ford, if you're General Motors 20 years ago and you want to introduce a new feature, what do you do? Typically have like a 10-year roadmap, and then at the end of 10 years, you put it in the new car, do some ads, everyone buys the new edition, right? You want anti-lock brakes? Okay, that's going to go in the next model. What does Tesla do when they introduce a new feature? If you bought last year's Tesla and it didn't have Right, the new feature, which is the full stop at the stop sign. Right, they used to have the California roll, you know, like, <laughs> which I thought was much more realistic. Right, you know, they say, oh no, we got to get rid of the California roll. We got to put in the full stop, right, at the stop sign. Do you have to go buy a new Tesla? No, you just download the new Tesla. Right, you just got yourself a new Tesla. Just like right now, while you're sitting here, listening to me babble on. Your phone is probably updated 50, 60 times, all the different apps that you have on your phone, without you pushing any buttons. So one of my favorite examples of this, right, which I've mentioned, I think, before in another talk, was a couple years back, right, some guy left his kid in a car, and, and the car was overheated, and the kid 
died, right? Very horrible story. And uh, so all the car companies were trying to figure out, like, what do we do? How are we going to fix this? And they had, like, the 10-year roadmap and the five-year roadmap and all this kind of stuff. And what Tesla did is they, they had a hackathon, and they came up with a new feature. It's called the dog feature. Right? You guys all know about this? Anybody here have a Tesla? You ever use the dog feature? Okay. So how were they able to launch this thing so quickly? No five-year roadmap, just a hackathon. They had an air conditioning API, a motion detection API. All you got to do is stitch it together with an if-then. Boom. That's your product. Okay? You have a team that's responsible for each of those functionalities, right, that owns that functionality, and then you create a new way of connecting those functionalities. Okay? I'm going to give you another example. This is from uh, the airlines. This is a couple years ago. I was, uh, I was stuck on the, on the tarmac. At, at an airport, and my flight was canceled. Right? Does this happen to you? Yeah, happens all the time. Now, 10 years ago, if this happened, I would have been told, OK, uh, you need to go back inside the terminal. You need to wait in line. And then when you get to the front of the line, they're going to give you an option of various tickets so that you can get to your destination, right? And this whole process might take a couple hours. People might get angry. People get frustrated. People are like on Twitter saying, you know, this airline sucks, right? The employee of the airline is probably getting on Twitter saying this airline sucks because they're standing there, you know, dealing with all these irate customers. Okay, now, if, you're, if your company is actually a listening company, your employees are going to say, hey, this sucks. We need to fix this. So how would you fix it? The employee is complaining. I have to deal with irate customers. I'm sitting here for two hours dealing with all this stuff. So the folks right, in IT would probably say, OK, I got an idea. Why don't we, first of all, get rid of this old clunky interface, create a useful interface so that people can get hired and start using it you know, 24 hours after being hired. OK, let's get a better interface. It's more you know, easily to learn and easy to understand, maybe a touch screen type solution. And then let's use machine learning to automatically assign the customers to different you know, Flights based on what we know about the customer, what we know about the availability and the ticketing price and all that other stuff, right? Now, here's the thing. If you do that, well, then why do you need the employee anymore dealing with this? Because if you create that interface for the internal customer, I mean, for the internal customer, the, the employee, all you got to do is flip a switch and present it to the final customer. And that's what they did. So when I was on the plane, I got a push notification that said, hey, flight's canceled. You want this flight? I'm like, yep, boom, done. And I start grabbing my bags. And it was only after I started grabbing my bags that the pilot announced, because he got a push notification, presumably, you know, after I did, right? <laughs> Saying, you know, hey, you're on this other flight, you know, you're staying at this hotel or whatever. Okay, now this is only possible because of the API architecture that the airlines had put in place. Okay, they were able to just modify a couple different things. Okay, so the point here is that, right, let's skip all this stuff on networks. We have, what are the human capital needs for these new types of organizations? You can't have people investing in firm-specific human capital. You can't have people figuring out, working at a company, working at Facebook for 12 years to figure out, like, who's in charge of what and who you need to talk to to get what done. You can't have an organization where you are spending all your time learning the politics of the organization. Because by the time you figure it out, you're already moved on to another job. So this new organization of the firm has profound implications for right, how human capital works. We're going into kind of hyper-modularization of human capital so that you can flow from company to company, get up to speed in a matter of days, and start adding value. This means standardization. Standardization not just through APIs, but through that human interface with the organization. So we need standardized interfaces across organizations, right? Across different parts of the organization, but also between people and the organization. Part of what I'm trying to do here at Haas is to raise a new generation of managers who are the human APIs between the tech side of the business and the business side of the business. 
Because these two sides of the business, if I'm trying to figure out where we have the biggest divide, where we have the biggest frictions, it's typically between the tech side and the business side. And folks like Haas MBAs are able to kind of rotate back and forth across these two. Ultimately, we'll get to a point where there won't be two sides, right? Because the tech side and the business side will be the same side, OK? That's where we're headed. Now, one final thing I'll say about what's so amazing about this new architecture of Lego bricks and modularity is that it reduces the cost of failure substantially. Right? Remember, the secret to innovation is having a low cost of failure. So this is an example all the Amazon people love to talk about when Jeff Bezos introduced the Fire Phone. You guys remember this? How many of you bought a Fire Phone? <laughs> they gave it to you for free, right? Yeah, there you go. So you got a free copy, right? OK, so their willingness to pay was zero. Actually, your willingness to pay was a couple months of work. OK. So this thing was a total bust. Nobody bought the thing. Failure. Now, I'm, I'm presuming you did not get fired as a result of this. OK, a typical company, heads roll, blame finger pointing. Who's the loser that proposed this? Who's the jackass that made us waste millions of dollars on this? Right, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what they did at Amazon. Why? Because all of the little features that went into this Fire Phone, they just went right back into the box of Lego bricks for the kids to play with, right? So for instance, they invented this thing, this voice recognition tool, which was super powerful and cool. So do you throw it out? No, you recycle it in the Alexa. So what do you think, failure or success? Massive success. Okay, we've got. Uh, facial recognition feature on the phone. What happened to that? Did they throw that out? No, they've got this in the Amazon Go store if you ever go there. Okay, so since you can redeploy the individual components, the little functionalities, both internally and externally, and you never know who your customer is going to be, that means that failure is, is cheap. Okay, so you, you probably heard this phrase from Mark Andreessen, right? Software is eating the world. Okay, I'm just gonna have to repeat it because I have said this before at some other earlier talks to the alums, but um, we've gotta say that APIs are eating the world. Okay, so you know, now all I need to do is get as rich as Mark Andreessen uh, so that I can uh, say this more often. Okay, so anyway, there's lots of other stuff I could talk about, but I'm gonna skip all this and just end with, uh, 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 there we go, we more, always have more extra stuff just in case. <laughs> need it, okay, but uh, I'll just end with, say, look, Ronald Coase, his whole dichotomy between firms and markets, which he articulated so eloquently, we have to revisit this story. Because firms are becoming markets, right? And markets are being replaced with ecosystems. The whole value chain that you learned in business school Right, the Michael Porter value chain, you've got to throw it out. Okay? Well, you never throw anything out. You have to layer on top of it new insights because it's not how companies work. It's not how business models work. Right? You're constantly in the business of selling other people's stuff, and they're in the business of selling your stuff. Remember, every company is a chimera, right? and those ecosystems are populated with, with chimeras. Okay? And so anyway, that's it for me. Uh, I'm happy to stick around after if I have any, co any questions. I, I think we're almost out of time. Um, but, uh, but hopefully you had some things you could take away. I'll, I'll post these slides so you can see where, where they're headed because there's a whole lot more that we could talk about. Um, but always keep in mind that right, everybody's your customer in today's world. The person down the hall is your customer. The person down the street is your customer. Right? Your employee is your customer. Your boss is your customer. Right? Accounting is your customer, marketing is your customer, okay? Your competitor is your customer, okay? Everybody's a customer in today's world, and it's made possible through this new type of business architecture, and this requires a new form of human capital that is more generalizable and more agile. So take this insight about the corporation, apply it to your own life, and you're doing it right now through continuous learning here at Haas. So, Thank you for coming. Welcome, and hopefully you'll be part of the Haas ecosystem for another couple decades. Um, thanks so much.
We certainly have time for some questions. If you have any, uh, raise your hands or please come down to the mic. One question. Well, I got some, I got some slides on that. Um, look, uh, I th I, I'm not, I'm involved in advising uh, quite a few of these, these DAOs. Um, and I think that the way people understand them is at the, at the current moment, there's, it's mo there's more promise than, than potential at, at this point, right? Because we, we've, we've seen similar forms of organization in the past, like cooperatives, and in their simplest form, Right, the, the governance mechanisms are, are inadequate to um, provide the kind of flexibility that you need. So I'm, I'm right now not passing judgment, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying they're not quite ready for, for prime time, the DAOs. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Just a sorry. question about kind of app applicability here for enterprise software and how you think about you know, building up an ecosystem and the kinds of deployments that are needed to connect, you know, different groups, departments, et cetera, et cetera, relevance there? Yeah, I mean, look, there's this constant battle between uh, companies that want to be kind of one-stop shops and, and companies that are trying to break up the one-stop shops, okay? And I think that we think about it a little too simplistically. Everybody wants to be the integration layer. Everybody wants to be the OEM. Everybody wants to be the enterprise software platform through which all the other ones have to go. And there's obvious reasons why you might want to do that, because then you get to capture all the first party customer data, and then you, know, you, you get to kind of dictate terms to those who are coming through your ecosystem. Just like you know, you'd rather be Apple than Angry Birds, because you, know, you have the App Store. But I also think that's a very limited way of, of thinking about things, right? Because not everybody can be the platform, right? And so you know, it's OK to be the little fish instead of just the big fish, right? I mean, remember. Google Maps, how did Google Maps get big? They were an app on the, the iPhone, right? That's how they got started. So, um, so I think that when we think about ecosystems and platforms, we have to think about it a little bit, you know, more, with a little bit more nuance. It's okay to be a little fish, it's great to be a big fish, and big fish need little fish, and little fish need big fish. Apps need platforms, platforms need apps, and you can be both a platform and an app kind of, kind of simultaneously. Okay, so I think that you know, if we were going to redo a course on strategy, you know, modern strategy, you know, that would be kind of one of the most important themes. Like how do you become a platform in the best possible way and how do you become an app in the best possible way? And, and you know, this jostling for position, which we're seeing go, going on, I have a couple slides in there that I skipped over, right? But there's a huge demand for, for you know, API integrators, for folks who can take this tangle of spaghetti code and you know, simplify it by, by you know, injecting some kind of hub and spoke um, you know, rationality. So yeah, I think uh, we should have a whole class on enterprise software strategy that would tackle all those different issues. Thanks. Do we have time well, for thank you more? so much, okay. Greg. Okay.